Welcome to the AV1611 Hour. My name is Nelson Turner. This broadcast is dedicated to the King James Bible, the Word of God in the English language for all the English-speaking peoples of the earth. Today, I'm going to preach a sermon that was inspired by a conversation with a Jehovah Witness yesterday. It was over an hour of debate, if not more, and known this man for some length of time. He's an itinerant salesman, and when he stops by my house, generally we can just talk about other things besides religion, but invariably he always comes back to the topic of Christianity, and he seeks to inculcate in me his particular views concerning the Bible and Christianity. And one of the main tenets of his faith that he does not have, he doesn't have faith in Jesus Christ as God does not believe Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. The Jehovah Witnesses uniformly teach and believe that Christ is a created being. So today I'm going to preach this sermon to answer the heresy of the Jehovah Witnesses and actually many other individuals in the world as well. Because essentially when it comes to the person of Jesus, some deny he ever existed. But generally, most men will acknowledge, at least in the Western world, will acknowledge that such a man as Jesus lived. What they dispute is that he was God manifest in the flesh. They dispute the fact that he was part of the Godhead, that he's very God. So today I want to answer these questions. Is Jesus God? What did he say about himself? What did the apostles believe about Jesus? Now it's very important as we approach all scriptures to remember, I mean every single verse in the Bible, we need to reference it in context of this statement in John chapter 4. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is a general rule that much must be followed at all times or you're going to lose track of everything else God this is John 4 24 God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth you must worship him through your resurrected spirit as it were because before you're saved you're spiritually dead but when you've been born again and washed in the blood, when you've been regenerated, when you've been made a new creature by the power of God acting upon and within your mind, soul, and spirit, then you have a spiritual apprehension, you have a spiritual capacity to have an apprehension of spiritual things. So we must worship him in spirit and in truth. Those two things are an absolute necessity if any man would see God and live. To worship God in truth, we must believe what God has revealed about himself in our Bibles. We must believe what he's revealed to all of his saints, both in the Old and New Testaments concerning himself. Now, we're going to first uh, answer the third question and then go backwards to my second question, and that will answer my first question. So, the first question I will address is, what did the apostles believe about Jesus? A Jehovah Witness, reading a King James Bible, and not discerning spiritual things by spiritual things, does not apprehend the truth that Jesus Christ received worship. He personally received worship because he was indeed very God. And we want to look at the example first of Thomas. Thomas the Apostle in John 20 verse 25. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. In other words, Thomas basically said, when I see, then I'll believe. Verse 26 of John and on down through 29 of John chapter 20. John 20, 26. 
And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. First notice here that the doors were shut. The Lord Jesus Christ did not open the door and walk in, but rather he simply moved right through the physical substance and entered the place. Since he is Lord of all, since he is very God, he could appear anywhere at any time to anybody as he so desired and pleased. He comes in and he says, Peace be unto you. When he comes to his own people, like I preached in my last sermon, he always bestows or wishes peace to be upon them, desires that they be in peace. And then he saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. By telling Thomas that, he bears witness to the fact that he knew everything that Thomas said, even though he physically, literally, visibly, was not present. He was present spiritually and heard everything that transpired when Thomas made his statement. This is one of the attributes of God. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro in the earth, beholding the evil and the good. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Now I'm going to stop there for a moment. If Jesus Christ were merely a created being and was simply a messenger to direct people to worship the Father only, he would not have received worship unto himself. And I would tell you, when you worship the Lord Jesus Christ, you are worshiping the Father. Because over in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, one of the titles of Christ there is the Everlasting Father. And in another place in Isaiah it says, His name shall be Emmanuel. That is God with us. When you have Jesus, you have God with you. He's very God. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. His profession of faith was that Christ was his Lord and that the Lord Jesus Christ was indeed his God. Now this would have been an excellent opportunity for the Lord Jesus Christ to rebuke Thomas and his disciples for their aberrant doctrine in applying in their speech to the Lord Jesus Christ the fullness of the Godhead. To worship him as God, he could have, they worshiped him as God, but they could have been corrected by him if he were not God. And surely, he being the way, the truth, the life, no man cometh unto him, unto the Father, but by him, he would have rebuked them and corrected them for their error. But does he do that? No, he does not do that. Thomas says unto him, My Lord and my God, and Jesus saith unto Thomas, Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. <clears throat> Here Christ anticipates that those that are not witnesses, or were not witnesses to his bodily resurrection, will not have seen it, but yet will believe it, and that they will be blessed. Words of Christ indicate that those that believe in Christ and the Lord are blessed, and Christ is our Lord. They're one and the same. If Christ were not God, he would have told Thomas so and refused the worship of Thomas. Over in the book of Revelation, we find John the Apostle falling before the feet of an angel as one dead to worship him, and he was told, See that thou do it not. He was told not to worship the angel. If Christ was merely a lower dignitary, if he was merely 
just a created being and not God absolutely and truly, he would not have received worship. And he would have done like the angel did in the book of Revelation to John and say, see that thou do it not. But instead, Christ receives the worship. Now, I've gone over this before, this Jehovah Witness, quite some time ago, that Christ received worship throughout the Gospels and never once refused to receive the worship of Jews or Gentiles. And I'll show that in a few minutes. He never refused their worship because their worship was a spiritual worship and it was a worship of the truth as God showed himself to be very God in the person of Christ. So we see that Thomas acknowledges that Jesus is his God. Since Jesus is very God, it is certainly acceptable to pray by the Spirit unto him. We pray to the Lord Jesus Christ. I say, dear Jesus, come before you with nothing good in me but your spirit, nothing good upon me but your blood, and no hope but you. And I beg you and plead with you for your unction, for your mercy, and for your grace this day to be able to do those things that are convenient in your sight. I seek his face that he might grant by his petition to the Father, and my petition going to him goes to the Father, and since Christ is my advocate, he represents me before the Father, and since I am in Christ and Christ is in me, when Christ appears before the Father, he appears on my behalf in the behalf of all those to whom believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. All those that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ are represented by Christ because Christ is their intercessor, he is their advocate, he is their daysman before the Father. Now, the example of Paul in the Pauline epistles and the words of Paul in the Pauline epistles, which are indeed the very words of God, and I have found in debating with the Jehovah Witness and so many other people over the course of my Christian life that for them to be heretics and hold their heretical beliefs, they must mutilate the King James Bible. They put no trust in God's word and they put faith in themselves, determining that they are their own final authorities of which verses are right in the Bible and which verses are incorrect. They have never grasped the principle in Isaiah 66, 2, part B. To this man will I look, to him who is a humble of a humble and contrite spirit, and part B, and trembleth at my word. I come before God's word with fear and trembling. I come before the King's English representing the true word of God in the English language for English speakers it does. It is the manifestation of God in a verbal form for us. So I come before it with trembling. The Bible says, I think it's Proverbs 13, 13. Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed, but he that fear the commandment shall be rewarded. I'll never forget the day the Lord quickened that verse to my soul. I was out running, road running, at like 8.30, 9 o'clock at night, having the sun having just about gone down, in fact had gone down, I was running down a road, two lane road, into a declivity or a low spot, and I was meditating upon my Christian life and how I was just so filled with sin and how even though the Lord had wrought a great work in me and done a mighty work in me and brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light, there were many, many things that troubled me in my life that were sinful, 
whether they were the mere thoughts going through my mind, the desires of my heart at times, or things I actually did. I was mourning and distressed over my the state of having the old man gain mastery over me at various times throughout the day <clears throat> and being in distress of mind and convicted in my conscience of these things all of a sudden Proverbs 13:13 13, 13 came into my mind and the Lord showed me that he didn't say he that keepeth the commandment shall be rewarded there in Proverbs 13 whoso feareth the commandment shall be rewarded but whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded and that gave me peace because I did fear the commandments of God I feared and trembled before the written word of God I came on to it as if it were very God itself and I believe that God and his word are one now, I do not believe that my printed Bible that you can see in front of me here this facsimile reprint of the AB 1611 King James Bible I do not believe that paper and ink and leather constitute the Godhead I don't believe anything of the sort I believe that God is a spirit but I do believe that the Spirit of God was given to the Lord Jesus Christ without measure that's what the Bible says and that the Lord Jesus Christ is very God at this present time he was always and he will always be now Paul his testimony is uniform throughout his epistles and in 1st Timothy 316 I read and quote and without controversy great is the mystery of godliness God was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirit seen of angels preached unto the Gentiles believed on in the world received into glory I'm not going to make comment on the whole passage, but mostly on one phrase in the passage. God was manifest in the flesh. Christ, when he resurrected, had a flesh and bone body, but he poured out his soul on the death, poured out his blood, and was numbered with the transgressors. transgressors. But he was on the earth, God manifest in the flesh. That is why Thomas did him worship. That is why the Canaanite woman gave him obeisance. That is why the Syrophoenician woman worshipped him. Because they understood that he was God manifest or declared in the flesh. Now the word manifest is an adjective it comes from the Latin manifestus and Webster in his 1828 dictionary of American English defines the word manifest as this plain open clearly visible to the eye or obvious to the understanding apparent not obscure or difficult to be seen or understood so if we take the phrase God was manifest in the flesh and we read the phrase without the word manifest but substitute into the phrase the definition of the word manifest now I'm not changing the Word of God I'm explicating and expounding the Word of God because every word has a signification a definition or a meaning as you would say and the meaning of the word manifest is plain. So God was plain in the flesh. It also means open. God was open or clearly visible 
to the eye and obvious to the understanding in the flesh. Oh, that men would simply open the Bible, approach it with faith, reverence, trust, and bow before the words of God and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save the soul. How much better of a place would this world be instead of being populated with heretics and deceivers and liars and despisers of those that are good? The world will be filled with righteousness. So God was obvious to the understanding in the flesh. God was apparent in the flesh. God was not obscured or made difficult to be seen or understood in the flesh. What greater testimony could one find anywhere than that? God was manifest or made plain, made plain clearly visible or open and obvious to the understanding to be seen. The Lord Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh while he's upon the earth and while he's in heaven. Another thing I brought up to the Jehovah Witness, God is omnipresent. And in the Bible, since I have it open here, uh, the same two pages I had open for my other reference of John chapter 4, verse 23, if you turn in your Bibles, if you're following along with your Bibles, it ought to be your Bible, a King James Bible, should be your Bible. John 3, 13. Christ says to Nicodemus, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. God was manifest in the flesh before the very eyes of Nicodemus. And when God manifest in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to him, he said, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, speaking of himself, even the Son of Man, one of Christ's titles, the Son of Man which is in heaven. Nicodemus had a revelation given unto him. The Lord Jesus Christ spoke very plainly to him concerning spiritual things and since spiritual things could only be discerned by spiritual things Nicodemus did not understand the new birth when Christ spoke of being born again Nicodemus thought in natural terms of natural things he thought what can I go inside my mother and come out a second time he did not apprehend or comprehend what Christ was saying and we have no record whether or not he apprehended or comprehended of what Christ was saying here at this point in time. But later, I think Nicodemus came to a right understanding that God was indeed manifest in the flesh, and it was he to whom he had spoken and who had revealed spiritual truths to him. The Son of Man which is in heaven. Christ told Nicodemus, that you may be looking at me, so to speak, but while I'm here, I'm also in heaven. He was in more than one place at the same time. Why, the Bible says God fills heaven and earth. I do not teach, nor do I believe, so don't misconstrue my words, that God is imminent or part of the creation. But God upholds all things by the word of his power, and in so doing, in a sense, he's everywhere at once. He's an infinite being, and as an infinite being, he upholds all things by the word of his power. All the created things are innervated and kept in motion and kept in life by his superintending power spirit and influence 
So we see that Paul gave testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ that he was God manifest in the flesh. That's six words. You would think that six of God's words bearing testimony of himself and of his nature would be enough for anyone. But they're only enough for those that are given faith to believe. Now, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6 from the Pauline epistle to the Philippians. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And I'm not going to go on. I'm going to stop there because I'm going to keep the topic at hand before your eyes and ears and spirit. But you might understand, or you might better understand, what you probably already know. And that this might be not just an instruction or edification or exhortation to the saints to earnestly contend for the faith once given on the saints, but that it might be an instruction and exhortation to those that do err in doctrine. Jesus Christ, when he came on the earth, was existing or manifesting or being in the form of God. Now the word form is a noun. It's defined by Webster as the shape or external appearance of a body. The figure is defined by lines and angles. The manner of being peculiar to each body which exhibits it to the eye is distinct from every other body. The body, the physical being of the Lord Jesus Christ while he was on the earth was distinct in form from every other body. It was uniquely God's body. It was a body of flesh extracted from flesh, but the blood in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ was not man's blood. It was not Adamic blood. It was God's blood. The virgin who knew not a man gave birth to the Son of Man who is Christ Jesus our Lord and Savior. The humanity came through Mary. The divinity came from God. It's as simple as that. When I talked to the Jehovah Witness. I brought up that it says in chapter 11 of Genesis, of God, let us go down and there confound their language. And back earlier, in Genesis, in the creation account, it says, let us make man in our own image. Our, plural. And so what we have today, the fallen, dirty, reprobate, antichrist pope, usurping the place of God, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, he speaks in the plural. He says, we this and we that and our. He speaks as a plural because he's usurping the position of God or seeking to. Now, when I say we believe, I mean we as a body of believers, those of like precious faith where we here in this local assembly believe certain things. But the dirty Pope, seeking to impersonate the everlasting God, speaks in a plural pronoun of himself, who is merely one individual sinner. I thought I'd bring that out. But the word form has another definition in Webster's 1828 Dictionary of American English. Before I reference that, in his definition, 
Webster mentions Daniel 3.19. The form of his visage was changed, speaking of Nebuchadnezzar. And then in Mark 16.12. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked. That's on the road to Emmaus. Christ appeared in a form so as to hide from their eyes that he was indeed Christ. They didn't recognize it till he departed from them. But Webster's tenth definition of the word form is likeness or image. And then he says, Philippians 2, 6, who being in the image of God, who being in the likeness of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, I cannot describe to you or explain to you the essence of the Trinity. I can't explain to you how the Trinity operates beyond what the Bible says of it. I can't even comprehend three persons of one essence. It's beyond human understanding. There are some things that are better left not messed with. When I talked to the Jehovah Witness, and I said Elohim, I said, so that's obviously referring to more than one person there, or more than one personality. He says, well, how many of them are there? Two, three, four, five, six? What a specious and fallacious argument that was. I remember studying the Bible in Luke when I was very young as a believer and in the first couple chapters of Luke I could three see all three persons of the Godhead present and acting in complete harmony the Jehovah Witness said to me that the Council of Nicaea established this doctrine it was not believed by the early Christians I told him that's not so he said that they established the Athanasian Creed and this and that I, when I was born again, and before I was born again, and after I was born again for some length of time, didn't even know what the Apostles' Creed was, couldn't remember it, couldn't recite it, even though I'd been in a church that said it by rote, I was raised in an infidel Methodist church. Um, I didn't remember anything about any of these creeds. I didn't know who Athanasius was. I didn't know who Arius was. I didn't know what the Council of Nicaea was the Nicene Creed. I had no idea those things. My belief in and my understanding that God is a triune being of one essence but three distinct persons or personalities came from reading the scriptures. Now, I want to, as a sidelight, show something here. If you look in your Bible, you'll find that the word Godhead occurs three times in your King James Bible. And I believe the translators that translated the underlying languages compared diligently with previous translations, that these translators that produced this book before me the King James Bible, the AB 1611, as it's referred to as well, they, in the integrity and uprightness of their hearts, were seeking to do their absolute best by the blessing and mercy of God to present us with a completely accurate and fair representation of what was in the original languages that they had access to. I do not say the originals because in the time of the translation of the King James Bible, no originals existed. And no originals exist today. And the Jehovah Witness said it doesn't say that in the originals. I said you don't have them. You have no final authority. And he, some would accuse me of being a Ruckmanite, I'm not. I hold to the doctrines of grace. No Rachmanite holds to any 
of the five points of Calvinism, but the perseverance of the saints. And they don't even call it that. I've been exposed to it, and for a while, I listened to Ruckman, but I got past that. He, teach it, he taught many cunningly devised fables, but he also taught some things that were true. And I know one thing for sure, that before I ever heard of Peter S. Ruckman, when I began reading the King James Bible, I believed the words that I found in it were absolute pure and true words. Because that's what the words related, me, related to me, that they were pure. The words of the Lord are pure words. Thy word is very pure. Therefore, thy servant loveth it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. When I read those things, I had faith that they were true, that these things were true. But in Acts chapter 17, we read, verse 29, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold, or silver, or stone, graven by art and man's device. Romans 1.20 For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Speaking of Christ, Paul the Apostle, gives us by revelation and inspiration. Yes, it's given by revelation to Paul and by inspiration of God. The inspiration of the Almighty giveth men understanding, as it says in Job. Colossians 2.9 For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. If that's not plain enough, we'll go ahead and do define the word fullness. But the Bible says that in Christ dwelt and dwelleth. Present tense. Because Paul is speaking after the resurrection. For in him dwelleth, he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. But as he's seated there, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Can I explain that to you? No, I can't explain that to you. But I can tell you that you ought to believe it because the scripture says it and God's spirit gives it to God's saints by revelation. No one disputes the manhood of the Lord Jesus Christ, but they will dispute his Godhead. And that third and last reference to the word Godhead, one, two, three, in the King James Bible, the third one nails the doctrine down. Godhead occurs three times. Why? Father, Son, Holy Ghost. But the third reference refers to the Lord Jesus Christ specifically and says that all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. Fullness means the state of being filled so as to leave no part vacant, vacant Second definition, the state of abounding or being in great plenty. For in Christ dwelt all the great plenty of the Godhead bodily. For in Christ dwelt all the completeness of the Godhead bodily. That's what the word fullness means. <clears throat> it means completeness. The state of a thing in which nothing is wanted, perfection. For in him dwelleth all the perfection of the Godhead bodily. That's the definition of the word fullness. How can you think that Christ is anything less than fully God if you have faith in the Bible, meaning the King James Bible, the King James Bible being a faithful and accurate represented representation of the underlying original languages. Let's go one better. The epistle, Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews. If you can see I'm a little fired up. Well, it's 
praying for direction, wanted to produce or put out some more sermons. It's been on my heart. But I have to be stirred by the Spirit of God. Just like when the angel went down into the pool of Siloam, the waters were stirred. The Lord has to stir the waters of my soul. And then I have a topic, and I have the substance of what I am to preach. I'm not telling you that God dictates to me verbally, word by word, what I'm supposed to say. That's not what I said. But if I'm not speaking under some kind of influence of God, there's no point in listening to me. I'm here to put forth God's words, not my words. I'm here to explicate and give the understanding and the sense, as is spoken of in Ezra and Nehemiah, to give the sense and the understanding of God's word to those that will hear. I'm not doing this of myself. In and of myself, I have no power. I have no strength. I have no wisdom. I have no knowledge. I have no might. All the learning, all the carnal learning and reasoning that I could have gained from a seminary would have done me no good without the Spirit of God being within me and enlightening in the eyes of my understanding that I may, might be able to comprehend spiritual things. And if that's happened to me, I have no cause for boasting or being proud at all. It's another thing that Jehovah Witness told me yesterday. He was proud to worship Jesus Christ and worship the Father. And why he was worshiping Jesus Christ if he didn't believe he was God, I don't know. But he told me he was proud of his spiritual activity. I'm not proud of my spiritual activity. My spiritual activity is weak, deficient, wanting, and all my spiritual activity needs to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ to have any merit or any value before Him. And only what God does in me is going to last. Everything else is going to burn. See, Christianity isn't just a Bible, it isn't just a King James Bible. It's the Spirit of God in the Christian bearing witness to the words of God in the Bible and magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ and giving Him the preeminence. Any will that is in me to do good and to do right is a will infused or inspired by God. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing, but in my spirit. Christ lives in my heart by faith. I live in him and he lives in me. And so anything right, anything good, anything true, anything edifying, anything comforting or encouraging to any of God's people it's by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ alone. Hebrews chapter 1 it says in verse 1, God at sundry times in diverse manners. Down in verse 3, I read Hebrews 1 verse 3. Speaking of Jesus Christ, who being the brightness of his glory. Remember Christ said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus Christ is the light, and the entrance of thy word giveth light. Psalm 119, it giveth understanding unto the simple. I have opened my mouth and panted, for I have longed for thy commandments. He being the brightness of God's glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ upholds all things, innervates, and bears up the whole world by the word of his power upholding all things.
That's the saved and the lost. That's rocks, minerals, atoms, neutrons, neurons, whatever it is. Anything that has a substance, anything that has existence, anything that has form. He upholds it by the word of his power. All things. He upholds all things, whether they be in heaven, whether they be in earth, or under the earth, by the word of his power. He upholds the whole of heaven above. All the stars and suns that therein are, the moon and all the planets. He upholds them all by the word of his power. Jesus Christ is the creator God is the creator Christ is God and he is the creator the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep over in Genesis chapter 1 the Spirit of God does not work without the will of the Son of God or God the Father the Spirit of God manifest the power of God the Father, and the magnificence of God the Son. And God the Son upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself, alone of the people there was none with him, purged our sins, a specific group of people, a certain group of people, a distinct and finite number of people had their sins purged, by the Lord Jesus Christ in his death and his pouring out of his blood upon the cross. And once he did that, he rose again and sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. But back to this phrase. As if it weren't enough to say that Christ is the brightness of God's glory, Paul says that Christ is the express image of God's person. Express is defined as an adjective by Webster as plain. So, Christ is the plain image of God's person. Christ is the clear image of God's person. Christ is the expressed image of God's person. Christ is direct and not ambiguous expression of God's person. person given in direct terms. That's what the definition is as well. In other words, the express direct terms of God's image. The express image of God's person. This is the express image of God's person. person. It's not implied or left to inference. We do not infer that Christ is God it's expressed and plain to us that he is God. It's not by implication. It's by plain revelation in the Bible that Christ is God. The word express can also mean copied, resembling, or bearing an exact representation. So, the word express being defined as bearing an exact representation. Uh... Christ bears an exact representation of God's person. He's an exact representation. He's the fullness and completeness of the image and express person of God. So that he that hath seen Christ hath seen the Father. That's what Jesus said. He said, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. That's why he's called the everlasting Father chapter 9 verses 6 and 7 of Isaiah let's go now to another Pauline epistle to Colossians chapter 1 verse 14 and down on through to verse 19 in whom we have redemption through his blood Acts 20 28 as I've referenced already Christ had within him flowing through his body, God's blood. It was divine blood. Even the forgive, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. 
God's blood covers sinful human blood. When God looks down, he doesn't see our sinful inheritance, our sin inherited from Adam through Adam's blood. He sees his son's own divine blood. And with that divine blood, he was well pleased. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God the Father, when God the Son trod the earth, was well pleased with all that pertained to the Son. All that he did, all that he was, all that he would ever be, and all that he ever had been. The Father loved the Son eternally, and the Son loved the Father eternally. Whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created, that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Proverbs 16, 4. The Lord hath made all things for himself. Our very existence, our very creation, the very act of creating, God did the act of creation for his own purposes, for his own pleasure, for his own reasons. We do not exist by ourselves, of ourselves, or for ourselves. We were created by him. We owe all of ourselves to him. And it is our duty to render ourselves to him through obedience to his word. All things were created by him and for him. The Lord hath made all things for himself. Yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. God's created man upright, but man has found out many witty inventions. God made man perfect in the day that man was created, but the man and the woman in the garden had a free will, so to speak. They had the potential to sin, though they were not created sinners. We cannot and will not impute sin to God. God is a holy, just, and righteous being. He's always been and will always be. He's of too pure of eyes to behold sin. So he covers it with his own blood. But where he does not cover sin with his own blood, he's made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Now, Colossians 1, 17. And he is before all things. God comes first. And by him all things consist. Whatever is down here, whatever has been down here, whatever will be down here, time past, time present, time future, all consist by him. It subsists and consists by him. And he is the head of the body, that is Christ. The church, the church is his body. Who is the beginning? The firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. The Lord Jesus Christ is to have the preeminence. What does that mean? That means, the word preeminence, it means as a noun, superiority and excellence, distinction, distinction in something commendable, as preeminence in honor or virtue, Preeminence in eloquence, in legal attainments, or in medical skill. Then Webster uses this sentence to help define the word. The quotes, this I quote Webster, the preeminence of Christianity to any other religious scheme. Christianity has the preeminence because Christ has the preeminence, because Christ is very God and God should have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. 
The word preeminence means precedence, priority of place, superiority in rank or dignity. It also means superiority of power or influence. We've already found out that Christ has a superiority of power because he upholds all things by the word of his power. Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who shall say unto him, who may say unto him, what doest thou? And that's what all heretics of whatever stripe, whatever color of the rainbow they may be, they all say to God, what doest thou? And who art thou that thou shouldest rule over us? They say, we will not have this man to rule over us. But in the last phrase, Colossians 1.19, it pleased the Father. What pleased the Father? That in the Son, that is in Christ Jesus, should all fullness dwell. Again, what does the word fullness mean? Well, it's a noun from the word full. And it means the state of being filled so as to leave no part vacant. The state of abounding or being in great plenty. The great plenty of the Godhead dwelt in Jesus Christ in all its fullness. I can't explain it to you, but I can tell you that it's true. The state of abounding or being in great plenty, abundance. It also means completeness. The state of a thing in which nothing is wanted. Perfection. Christ exhibited upon the earth and now in heaven and before the foundation of the world. All the perfection of the Godhead. If you've seen Christ, you've seen God. I would tell you, I've said this before, and I should probably turn there, quote it accurately, but in Hebrews, and it's be hard for me to find it in this Bible, but I'll do it in Hebrews, I believe it's chapter 2, yeah, chapter 2, this is Revelation, back a little bit to Hebrews, past the epistles, James, and Hebrews. Chapter 2, uh, but we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, that he, by the grace of God, should taste of death for every man. Now, we see Jesus spiritually. Someday we'll see him face to face. His name shall be on our foreheads. He'll give us a new name. We'll be raised up in his likeness, in his image. But till then, we see him spiritually. And all the perfections of Christ can be found in the English words in the King James Bible. All the beauty, all the glory of Christ. God has chosen the means and the vehicle of his word to show the beauty and glory of his son. He does it other ways too. He shows the beauty and glory of his son through the manifestation of the spirit of his son here in the earth. He glorifies and magnifies himself by the manifestation of the Holy Ghost, magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ and glorifying the Father in the lives of Christians. Now, Christ as I've said, receive worship. And before I go to some instances of him receiving worship besides the worship of Thomas, and again, we should only worship God and no other. So when we worship Jesus, we do worship God. But the word worship as a verb transitive means to adore, to pay divine honors to. So when Thomas said, my Lord and my God, he paid divine honors to the Lord Jesus Christ. It means to respect, to honor, to treat with civil reverence. It means to honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. That's how I came to Christ. That's how I live before Christ. 
and I do it very imperfectly. Flawed creature, sinful man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I come before him with fear and trembling. I come before the word with fear and trembling. I come before him in abject submission with my face in the dust before him. Bowed on my knees, my face to the ground, humble prayer and supplication, praising and glorifying him for him making me accepted and the beloved in his own person. He's made me accepted in himself. So I honor him with extravagant love and extreme submission. If every person on the face of the earth did that, what a place the world would be. And what a place heaven's going to be where every single person is and will do that. Worship as a verb in transitive means to perform acts of adoration, to perform religious service. And then Webster cites John 4.20. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. They performed their religious service in the mountain. Now, Matthew 2, Matthew 2 and verse 11 in your King James Bible. And if you don't have a 1611 facsimile reprint, that's quite all right. You're going to find the same thing that I'm going to read out of Matthew chapter 2 and verse 11 in this 1611 reprint, so to speak, or facsimile. These men, these wise men, inquired in verse 7 of Herod diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to the Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. Notice it's not a babe in a manger. It's a young child. When you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. The young child. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they were not in a manger, they were in a house. Christ was a young child, likely ambulatory by then, walking. And they saw the young child with Mary's mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. That's all we need to say there. They worshipped him. They honored him with extravagant love and extreme submission. Did Mary say, you're making a mistake? This boy's not God. Don't worship him. Did Joseph intervene? We have no record of that. Mary saw what they did, and she probably wondered deep in her heart, what is this, my child, that men should come and adore and worship him and pay reverence unto him? Who is this young child? I believe she understood and knew, but that the understanding and knowledge of Jesus Christ her Savior and Mary called him her Savior her understanding the revelation of her son Jesus Christ she wasn't the mother of God she was the mother of Jesus she was the mother of the humanity of the man Christ Jesus She's not the mother of God. She was not an eternal, immortal being that has no beginning or no end. She is not an intercessor that you pray to or worship. No. You pray to and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you worship him, you're worshiping God the Father. But anyhow, these men fell down and performed an act of adoration for the Lord Jesus Christ when he was a young child. Matthew 9.18. You turn there. And while he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. This certain ruler that came to Christ came believing that he was God. 
because he believed that Jesus Christ could raise the dead. And who could raise the dead but God Almighty? So when he came and worshiped Christ, he came and honored him with an extravagant love and an extreme submission and an act of adoration. How about Matthew 14, 33? And when they were in the ship and came and worshiped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. Those that were in the ship worshiped him. They showed acts of extreme adoration and submission and love to the Lord Jesus Christ is very God. Matthew 15, 22. I mentioned this earlier. Down through verse 28. Matthew 15, 22 through 28. This is one of my favorite incidences that occurred in the life of the Lord Jesus while he was on the earth because we see the picture of the salvation of the Gentiles and that the name of God would be great among the Gentiles. The name of God is great among the Gentiles and it was prophesied that it would be. And God has magnified his word above all his name but we still lift up the name of Jesus Christ and we come before him as the only way to God the Father he is the only way he said I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto me but by the Father but he also said I and the Father are one I'm not here preaching the Trinity distinctly I'm preaching the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ to answer the question is Jesus God yes he is God the Apostles the disciples believed he was very God that he was the Son of God and really the very express image of God the very express image of the brightness of God and they believe that and so too did the Gentiles that came to the Lord Jesus Christ. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. She recognizes his legal authority over the nation of Israel, that he was descended of David after the flesh. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil, but he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Christ was a Hebrew nationalist. He was an Israeli nationalist. He was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He was the fulfillment of of the promise to the people of Israel. He was the fulfillment of the Abrahamic and Davidic covenants. And he came only for the people of Israel. But because it was prophesied of him that he would show salvation on the Gentiles, he came for a greater purpose. In fulfilling the Abrahamic covenant in all the nations of the earth would be blessed in the seed of Abraham and that seed is Christ so the woman came and besought him and the disciples wanted her to be sent away and he said I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel then came she and worshiped him she fell down before him you know who Christ hears you know whom Christ answers when they pray to him those that worship him as God Jesus said except ye believe that I am he you shall die in your sins I told that to some Jehovah's Witnesses a good 20 22 years ago came up to my property I was um, plowing up some land prepping my garden covered with mud and they started giving me their business to Jehovah's Witness women and finally I just told them I said except you believe he is God, you'll die in your sins. You're going to hell. Start shouting it out, and they finally left. But, you know, this woman came and worshiped him. She worshiped him as God. 
if she hadn't have worshipped him as Lord and God, he would have paid her no mind. She came and answered him, saying, Lord, help me. She begged him for her dear child, for her dear daughter. Lord, please help me. Help me. Help my daughter. Get this devil out of her. She's sore vexed. And Christ looked at her and said, he answered her and said, it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. Gentiles to the Lord Jesus Christ while he's upon the earth looked upon them as dogs because he was a Hebrew nationalist. He preferred his own clan, his own tribe, as it were, his own people above all other people. He loved his people with a special love. But included in this people are Jews first and Gentiles also. And she, instead of saying, Lord, I'm not a dog, why do you talk to me so? She said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. What was her faith? That Jesus Christ was the son of David and that he's the son of God? God, the fullness of the God had dwelt in him bodily, that he was able to do all things. He wasn't a mere man in her sight. He was much more than a man. He was one worthy of extreme submission, adoration, and worship. And when she said this, Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. What more testimony do we need? How much further do I need to go? One passage or one verse teaching a plain truth that's taught many other places should be sufficient for someone to understand and know that Jesus Christ identified himself as one with the Father and as very God manifest in the flesh. That those that were given a revelation, a special revelation, that had seen him after his resurrection, as Paul did, understood that when they saw the resurrected Christ, they were seeing God. Matthew 28, 1 through 9. And in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. To see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. They believed the report that he was risen from the dead, that he was not there anymore. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail! And when Christ said that, they came and held him by the feet and did extreme submission unto him as one that loved them and they knelt in abject worship and submission to Lord Jesus Christ as to the living God if Christ were not God and were merely a created being as these infidel Arians teach he would have refused worship because certainly we believe that Jesus Christ, being the truth, necessarily always spoke the truth and did the truth. And if they were worshiping him as God in error, 
he would have corrected these women whom he dearly loved of their error. But he did not. Again, John 4, 23. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. You must worship Christ by the faculty of the Spirit and by the truth of God's revealed word. If we are to worship God in spirit and truth, we must acknowledge that Jesus Christ is truly God, truly God. No one disputes about his manhood. It is his Godhood that is objected to. Those that profess Jesus as their Savior but do not acknowledge him as God are not worshiping God in truth. It is written, Matthew 4, verses 8 through 11. Look to that verse, those verses in the King James Bible. Verses 4, 8 through 11. The temptation of Christ. Again, the devil taketh them up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. The devil was being, was demanding that Christ worship him as God. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Jesus said, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. For there to be any worship in that interaction between the devil and Christ, the only worship that would have been lawful, that would have been correct, and this is what Jesus indicates by his words, that the devil should have bowed down and worshipped the Lord Jesus Christ because Christ is very God. Not that Christ being merely a man should bow down and worship a being that he created in righteousness, but had fallen from that righteousness. Again, if anybody was going to worship anybody, the devil should have knelt before the Lord Jesus Christ. If you remember, the devil, over in Job chapter 1, had to appear before God before he could ever touch anything pertaining to Job or touch Job's flesh. And the devil can only do what he's permitted to do at God's behest. No more. You understand that the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty, God in spirit, truly God, the one to whom we offer extreme submission and abject, complete love, he stands between us and the devil. He doesn't stand between heretics and the devil, but he does stand between his own people and the devil. And since he's very God, we worship him as God. Jesus said plainly, and I've already quoted the verse in John, 8 verses 58 and 59 Jesus said unto them verily verily I say unto you before Abraham was I am that is ego I am me I am that I am he's identifying himself with the one who revealed himself in the tetragrammaton in the Old Testament the ineffable name of God as some would call it he is saying that he's the same one that appeared to Moses in the burning bush, that appeared to Joshua, that all the theophanies that occurred in the Old Testament, it was he who manifested the presence of God. And then he said in John 10, verse 30, I and my Father are one. Now, I fulfilled my mission here for this broadcast of the AB 1611 hour. It's my hope that you've received a blessing from this, that 
You might stand fast, stand on the Word of God, stand in subjection to the Word of God, and in so doing, in subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ, and war a good warfare by the Word of God, by the power of His Spirit, that you live and prosper and grow, and have the peace of God which passeth all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If you'd like to contact me, I encourage you to do so. I see that there's numerous views of sermons, but a few little feedback. You can certainly leave a comment. I encourage you to do so on YouTube or elsewhere, on Rumble if you'd like. But I encourage you also that you can contact me directly at Bookland, that's Bookland at Comcast.net, B-O-O-K-L-A-N-D at Comcast.net. My name is Nelson Turner. This broadcast has been the AV1611 Hour, which is devoted to magnifying and glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ by holding up the Word of God, the King James Bible. Until next time, may the Lord Jesus Christ richly bless you as you love and serve and worship Him.